Everybody. My name is Pete Hammond. I'm going to moderate today and uh, hope you all enjoy. Uh, Don't worry, darling. Isn't that great? Yes. Uh, thanks for coming out here on Sunday. And uh, I have uh, to introduce you to creative forces behind the movie you just saw. First up, she uh, wrote the screenplay as well as many other movies, including Book Smart. Uh, yes, with Olivia Wilde and, uh, and so many others. She's also a producer on this film as well. So please welcome Katie Silverman. And she is the director, producer, and co-star here. You know her from so many acting roles and now behind the scenes, Book Smart, which I just mentioned. And she did a great job with this. So please welcome Olivia Wilde. Congratulations, guys. I don't know if this is on or not. I can't tell, but no, yours yeah, is on. Mine's on. Uh, anyway, congratulations on this. I know it's been a long haul to get this done. <laughs> yes, we were just saying three years. Three years. So, yeah, very grateful that you all came out to see it. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. How exciting. This, this is always a good sign when you drive in here. You can't get a parking place. In yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could sort of tell. Um, so tell me how it came about first. That, that, you know, because obviously Booksmart was a big success critically, and uh, it put you on the map beyond your career to that date. It, it gave you a whole new direction. Um, and then uh, you could do almost anything you want. This is wildly different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it feels almost unfair that my mic's working and not yours, but you're better at projecting, so. I'll, I'll project. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we were so lucky with Booksmart that it, it, it put us in a position of, you know, being able to, to um, have the opportunity to do a lot of different comedies. And uh, we did dive into some different comedic ideas. And then, you know, it just, it, the idea of being able to um, embrace another genre that we both love so much, psychological thrillers. I mean, I love comedies, but I also really love psychological thrillers. And I thought what they have in common is the opportunity to catch the audience off guard and to um, surprise people and you know emotionally manipulate people and to have fun and to take advantage of the medium and uh, so we we dove into this and it was unexpected I mean people were like what what do you want to do <laughs> and it's like this is the one and um, yeah and then a lot of people wanted to make it which was great and unexpected and kind of a good sign for our business I think because you know, it's an original piece. It's not clear genre. It's sort of like you know, in between. And yet, you know, a lot of people really wanted to get involved even before we had a cast. And I thought, okay, that's a good sign for Hollywood that the studios had an appetite for something like this. I love. Well, now this is really. On. Hello. Uh, I love the title. I. You had me at. Don't worry, darling. Because when I heard that, I said, that is such a cool title. And then when I saw the movie, I said, this is so cool. It's even got a Rat Pack vibe mm -hmm. to it with that Palm Springs and mm -hmm. everything there. When you talk about different mix in the genres here, that it's not quite definable what it is. It's, it, it is original. Yeah, we love the Rat Pack energy of it all, too. Yes, that was a big part. <laughs> it's, um, it was very inspiring all the elements of that time period too that are fun. Because we talked a lot about the kinds of movies that are set in this time period, and especially ones that are examining the things that were more difficult then than we experience now, and how often it feels like a horror movie. And I think the element of the Rat Pack, especially the Rat Pack in Palm Springs, and, and what a blast it seemed like they were having, and how, how much fun their lives seemed to be, was a very exciting jumping off point in trying to capture something almost genreless, or at least in between those as well. 
I just remembered where the title came from. Um, there's an ad that was, don't worry, darling, you didn't burn the beer, which was a 1950s ad. <laughs> and the spec that Katie based the script on was written by the Van Dyke brothers, um, Shane and Carrie Van Dyke, and they had been really inspired by the ads, like uh, lots of different types of ads from the 1950s, and how, as Katie said, sort of horrific they seem to us now. But that's where it came from. Don't worry, darling, you didn't burn the beer. Uh, that's great. Uh, Katie, tell me about this collaboration and how this came about, obviously Booksmart, and uh, were you in it from right from the beginning, as you mentioned, the Van Dykes, so yes. how did that work out? Well, I feel so lucky to work with Olivia at all, let alone twice, I think, and it's interesting talking about the different genres too, because I think one thing that everybody knew while working on Booksmart was that she was obviously a, a very talented comedic genius on her own, but that she's such a good storyteller, everyone was very excited, I think, to see all the different genres that she will master. Like, it's fun to work with someone that you can tell has just a grasp on how someone will connect emotionally to something, whether it's comedically or scary or a thriller in a lot of different ways. So I had never worked in this genre before. I don't know if I would have been brave enough to if I wasn't working with her and hadn't been encouraged in that same way. But the uh, original script by Carrie and Shane Van Dyke, two really talented writers, was such a fantastic concept and, and idea. And we read it and we were really excited to <coughs> examine that same idea from a, a slightly different perspective, a, the perspective maybe from two women who we wanted to explore a little more of the nuance of the, the spaces that everyone could agree were horrific versus the spaces that you could maybe convince yourself were okay even if you know that foundationally they're based in something rotten. And so that was uh, the North Star kind of that we were focused on the whole time in terms of being able to, to shift the focus a little bit from something that everyone would be able to shake their head at versus something that hopefully would make people question their own instincts about it. Yeah, and, and it, it definitely has uh, the females at the forefront of it and behind the scenes. I have a list here that's phenomenal. You really have an, a great crew from costume designer Arian Phillips and production designer uh, Kate Byron. I know in my review, I said give them Oscar nominations right now because it is so beautifully designed and so colorful, so perfect in that regard. Set decorator, Rachel Ferrara, makeup, hair, oh my God, stunt coordinator, set designers, art director, casting, uh, obviously you guys. So was this intentional or how does that work out? I'm gonna give you a mic too so you can. Oh, here, I will here, look, oh, there we go. Um, the, it, I mean, it's intentional in that, in that, you know, I think we knew a few of these amazing people from Booksmart, like Tracy Dashenauer, stunt coordinator, who I think is one of the only female stunt coordinators, also a grandmother, um, <laughs> whose entire family are all in the stunt world, and uh, Katie Byron, production designer. Um, but then, you know, I really just wanted to have the best people and the people who were really drawn to the project. And a lesson that I learned on Booksmart was really not to base everything on resume because in a system, you know, historically dominated by men, if you base it on a resume, obviously you're gonna get a lot of the same men. It was who um, had these crew members worked with who they were really inspired by and who could they recommend. So it was a lot of like, who's somebody out there who you think is really incredible, who um, you would wanna work with. So it was like Ariane Phillips, who's obviously a legend, saying to her like, who do you think should be leading these departments? And they brought forward a lot of women. And I think that's the kind of really profound effect of women saying, okay, I'm, I have the opportunity. I'm now gonna reach um, back and grab someone else's hand. And, and we really benefited because we had this extraordinary crew. And it, it, we felt really proud to have this female dominated set, but it wasn't something like a mandate that we set out to um, check off a box. It really came from like who is passionate and who is everyone else inspired to work with. Yeah, and you had some great men too. I should mention Matthew Lavatisse, incredible cinematographer. And uh, we were talking backstage a little bit about the score here and John Powell, who's a you know another legend. And yeah, he's been around for a long time doing this. Yeah, that's the thing. I had the benefit of some really experienced people like Maddie, like John. 
um, who taught me so much. I mean, Maddie and I had worked together as actor and DP years ago, and that's when I first started um, kind of bothering him with questions and, and <laughs> begging him to someday um, work with me, and we made a short film together, and then that led to this, and he has um, just an unbelievable team, and we've also had an extraordinary group of female camera assistants, which was really exciting, because you were on set seeing these like women in their 20s you know, swapping lenses and hauling equipment, and it just felt like we were watching the future of Hollywood in a really exciting way. And at the center of all of this was our heroine, Florence, and to see, oh my gosh, this is a film grounded and dominated by an actress who is leading this film so independently, so capably, and had the kind of qualities for a film like this of a dramatic uh, star and an action hero. You know, and that, that was really, really exciting. You know, we were doing the, the car chase at the end and racing up that hill. I kept joking that she has a Tom Cruise run. She really does. It's like <laughs> remarkably <laughs> steady. Um, so it felt like, oh wow, this is this just feels this feels progressive in a way that's not forced. Right. Speaking of cars, I love the scene where they're all going it's so fifties, but they're all the women are saying bye-bye, and they're all going off to work in a different color, different model car, all in a row. Well, that, I mean, the choreography of the town was so important <laughs> to me. And the idea of, you know, now that, you know, the, you know everything, the idea that it's all designed, that, that, it, that it is something that is choreographed. Yeah. And that gave us um, a, a thread with which to determine the design of everything, from the palette that uh, uh, determine the you know the architecture, the cars, the clothing, all production design because it was all through the lens of Frank, right. Chris Pine's character. This is all his creation, and it was really kind of amazing to to have that as a guide. You know, everything was like, well, what would Frank choose? And even for the different men, we thought, oh, probably when they sign into the simulation, they get to choose. You know, the woman they drag in there and the car. We thought those are probably the two things, and like nationality and like some clothing. I hear there are the elements, like I don't know if, how noticeable it is, but Bill, who's the newest uh, husband, has a tiny car. Like you have to you move up in the system <laughs> and the small ways that Frank would create the hierarchy even within the choices. Yes, we had so much fun with that. Like, you know, as Jack gets a new car when he agrees to reset his wife and she goes in for the electroshock therapy and his kind of bonus is this new car, the little Corvette. <laughs> How did the buzz, I call it buzz beeper. How many people know who buzz beeper is? Okay, good. Oh, cool. Right, well, yeah, that's good big buzz the influence. She is so amazing, these overhead shots, not just of people, but of the whole place that's very buzz beeper -y. Well, and it's interesting because Busby is a kind of a problematic figure in his own right, a really complex man. And I think, you know, like many men in Hollywood in the 1930s, had a, a, a kind of a perspective of women that um, kind of didn't necessarily celebrate individuality, and he would create these unbelievably beautiful pieces with sometimes, you know, um, 100, over 100 dancers, often working with like 60 to 85 dancers, punishing choreography, and um, the idea was, was homogeny, you know, the idea was like work, move together like an organism, and that became this kind of definition of, of, of female beauty, and we were so inspired by that. And that's why the dancers, who are the same dancers playing the Busby dancers and the Nightmare dancers, it's the two sides of, of women. And what was wonderful is when our extraordinary dance team, who also appear in the film in different roles throughout, it's another fun like, Easter egg, they said that they really enjoyed being able to portray the kind of monstrous, more primal side of femininity in a way that, you know, in Busby's time, would never <laughs> have been welcome. No. no. <laughs> Although he was Warner Brothers, and this is Warner Brothers. Exactly. So there is a cosmic connection. Exactly. <laughs> it come, it come a little ways. Okay, Katie, okay, what was the biggest challenge? You mentioned you've not worked in this kind of a film before, so when you sit down to write it, are you collaborating? Do you have meetings? You, you talk? Are you on the same wavelength? How does the, your process work? I think the great benefit to me of, of developing stories and working with Olivia in that way is that you have such a constant sounding board as to what's working and not working. One of my other favorite things about working with her is how much of the script 
is a chemical equation of the actual act of making the movie. Like how much the, the story and the script continues to change based on who's cast and then based on the locations that they find and then based on ideas from other members of the crew. I think working with someone and especially a leader who has such a clear and unshakable knowledge of what a story is, it allows for such amazing collaborations because she really values every other member of the crew in a way where people feel like they can bring ideas to the table and we end up integrating so so much of them. We never stop. Yeah. <laughs> I mean never stop. Like people would see us talking and be like, no, there's more pages. Yeah. Coming. There's more pages. <laughs> don't don't talk to each other. Scurrying to the trailer to be like, they're doing it again. No. <laughs> like, um, but I think yes, especially for, and and I I was so excited for so many of the reasons that she said, which is that the genres are so similar and that it's about building tension and releasing it and catching people off guard and ideally establishing a, a tone that, you, that you're both keeping throughout in a good way and changing ways that are surprising people. Um, and so I think it, I, I was so excited by the challenge of doing something new in that way because I knew I had someone you know, at the helm of the ship who, who was going to take care of everyone so well and who knew what it was. But it, it was really particularly fun here to be able to continue to rework it with the amazing group of artists that were working in every different department, all of whom had such a committed and, and wonderful love for the story. And so then those ideas were coming from exactly the place that you wanted to. Yeah, like Maddie came up with the wall crush. Yeah. Oh. And Ariane came up with Dita Montes at the, at the big gala. It, it's great when you have that because you feel like everyone's so invested. Right. And everyone feels that their voice is really valued when they speak up at a production meeting, even early on, and they're like, I mean, I have a weird idea. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And you encourage that. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think when you, when you create the brain trust, you then need to let it let it thrive right. and I hire people based on that like who is someone whose taste I really love and who I know is going to come up with really wonderful ideas and we just continue to get inspired by everything when Katie Byron builds a house on stage which is extraordinary that that house was built on a on a sound stage with a trans light but everybody said it was completely impossible um, and she figured out a way to do that. And our editor, Afonso Goncalves, who's amazing, spent three weeks on the film before he realized that was on stage. And I was like, ooh, it's a good sign if the editor doesn't know. Uh, maybe he's not paying attention to the dailies, because we swing around to a lot of speed. But no, but it was so great, because everyone just felt so, so invested in a way that was really satisfying. It really felt like, ooh, we're all in this. I mean, that's why I love scouting. Hello. Oh, no. You're okay. Thank God. Um, <laughs> scouting is such an opportunity to hear from everyone. I love those van rides when people start saying, like, well, I was kind of thinking it reminded me of this or that. Chris Baugh, our locations manager, who's the best in LA, he is the one who found that volcano house out in um, Barstow. Yeah. And I had said in a meeting an impossible dream. Where I was like, I want the headquarters to be kind of mid-century, but sort of otherworldly. I want it to be elevated. I want it to be surrounded by salt flats. Um, and, and I was like, I want it to be like a shape that we can mimic. I mean, I was like, circular would be good. And he was like, I think I have an idea. <laughs> and we drove out there, and I just immediately started crying. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So where did the bulk of shooting, this was in Palm Springs, right? Palm Springs for the exteriors, like in the cul-de-sacs. Um, that's Canyon View Estates in Palm Springs. If anyone's a big fan of Modernism Week, yes. it's very cool. <laughs> yes, um, and they do. They put the cars in the driveways and everything. It's really great. And then the de desert stuff is in Barstow, and then all the interiors are in LA. The Dollhouse Gala was downtown, um, and everything else was on stage. I kept yelling at the screen when I saw it. I saw it in Burbank. Uh, but I yelled at the screen when she gets to the desert. She's on the trolley, the tram, or whatever, the tourist thing. And she, I'm going to go out there. No, no, no. Bad you know, idea. Why do these characters always just go out there by themselves? <laughs> Brave among us. I know it could have been a really short film. Well, actually, we wanted people. We wanted people to have the feeling of like just stay. I mean, that's the idea of. of the device at the end when Jack reappears. We want the audience, even though at that point they really understand how twisted the reality of it all really is, we want you to yearn for her to stay with him. Um, and 
you know, when we premiered it in Venice, there was this awesome collective gasp when he arrived, and I was like, oh, good, that's kind of what we wanted to be like, yeah, stay. And it's so demented because you really know she shouldn't. But it, it, I'm interested in that tension between the thing you want and the, the reason you know it's bad and why you often are caught in that space. And I think all of us in modern society are actually living in that space. We're aware of how, how unjust the system is, and yet we exist in it and we benefit from it. And it's like, how do we navigate that tension? It's, well, it's got a lot of important kind of themes. Well, it's a, first and foremost, a terrific entertainment, but it's got stuff that you can relate to today, and it's on its level here. Yeah. Using that as a North Star, that idea of, of how easy it is to settle back into something that doesn't force you to acknowledge the dark parts of something is was such a focus throughout. And the idea too that it's there are so many ways that people benefit from systems, as Olivia said, that they know are hurting others or they know are wrong on a deeper sense. And the bubble that you can create around your life to ignore anything that would remind you of that can be fun, can feel like a rat pack, can, can be feel like its own paradise. And, and the kind of hero it takes to acknowledge that and do something about it is is brave and courageous and worth following for a story like this and in general. And, and as she was saying, Florence's ability to inhabit both kind of the, the horrible moment of realizing that and not being able to turn back was was such a dream from having developed that character from the beginning. You know, Florence, she's like, uh, Florence Pugh is like a chameleon to me because I had just seen her in The Wonder, yeah. which is coming out, I think it's Netflix actually. And um, I wasn't focused on the whole cast when I went to see the movie. I like to go see and sort of not know what I'm seeing. And I'm going like, who is this actress? I know her, but I don't know who is she? And I, she just can inhabit all these different kinds of roles. Yeah, yeah, she's extraordinary in that way. And for this, you know, I, I, we were clearly very inspired by Bridget Bardot, and we yeah. thought, you know, this <laughs> is the the aesthetic that has been kind of chosen for her. Um, and and she wore it so well. When I told Flo, like, I'm thinking, you know, we just kind of turned you into Bridget Bardot. She was like, yeah, great, you know. And then, as you say, like in in the wonder, she's she which she went to directly from our set, she's okay. completely different. Oh my um, god, yeah. Which is what makes her so exciting. And talk about the rest of the casting. Harry Styles, you gave him a dance number. Yes. <laughs> yes. We were really. Um, I mean, you know, our focus for that character was really who could go toe to toe with with Florence, and help create a relationship that was authentic and nuanced and warm enough that you would really root for it. And it became very clear that Harry had a really strong understanding of that. And they created such you know, a, a, a layered relationship that felt in many ways modern, which is what we really wanted. We wanted them to feel kind of separate from the rest of the couples of victory. Right. Um, and he was wonderful. He brought so much to it. And then of course, Chris Pine, yeah. who in, my humble opinion, you know, this is one of his best roles. I'm that, such a fan of Chris's, but I just watching him embrace that kind of quiet, twisted power. Well, you know, we we told him when we when we talked to him, we were like, it's kind of Jordan Peterson, it's kind of um, uh, Tony Robbins, it's kind of Keith Raniere, like, <laughs> and he he's like, no problem, got it. Right? <laughs> yeah, you have to believe that they would be able to be under this guy's spell. Yeah. That he has that kind of magic. And uh, that's key or the whole souffle falls. Yes, and I love like a really charismatic villain. Yeah. And Katie was writing these extraordinary monologues and it was kind of twisted how good she is at like fascist <laughs> uh, you know, propaganda. So I, yeah, she's like, here, I've got to whip one out of her text. <laughs> what? <laughs> I like the um the dinner table where you know it all goes to hell for her and everything and he's very smooth he's oh, just you just watch we love him that and well because i love because he baits her because he wants her to be better at it he's bored <laughs> he's like somebody challenge me right. somebody be a little better at this and and play the game play the game and she keeps kind of not quite landing the argument right 
and he and he's pushing her and pushing her and then she loses control and actually we there was part of that was based on a Jordan Peterson interview where he 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 accused the woman interviewing him of not being very articulate yeah. and that's how he kind of shut her down and it was that very patronizing skewering awful kind of attitude and the feeling i think a lot of people might recognize which is when you feel like you have a good argument and nothing is sticking when like when you're trying to take somebody down and they don't even if they're laughing like nothing is affecting them and how that either ramps you up or kind of sets you off your access and and being able like in that moment we know how right she is and we want her to succeed hopefully and he is just nonplussed and how frustrating that is especially like a man that charming and handsome and with that much power to sit there nonplussed was such a fun dynamic to get to I mean the gaslighting the, the, the part that kills me is when she's really on a roll and he's like she's very sick and we'll get it out she is. <laughs> I mean it's just more evil to me than any like screaming violent villain right <laughs> Now, um, they've given me five minutes here, and I've got to talk about producing, because this is an audience of producers here, and you're both producers. And uh, so talk about the challenges from that point of view, of getting a movie made, you know, New Line Cinema and all of that, and how does that business part of it um, work? Yeah, well, you know, in COVID, who else made a movie during COVID? You guys all get it. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it was, it was, okay, first and foremost, about finding the right partner to do it with. We were really lucky. We had a bunch of people bid on doing the movie with us, and we wanted the place that would allow us to cast who we wanted and to really hire the crew that we wanted. And um, I was passionate about shooting it in LA. I, it, to me, it felt like it had to be in Palm Springs. So we found the place that would allow for that. And um, the people at New Line were, were really great. They, you know, it was different than a lot of the movies they were they were working on, but they um, really recognized what we were trying to do and they jumped on board. I think the COVID of it all, obviously we all know that adds a massive number to the budget. Right. That was really tricky. The logistics of it really tricky. I'm glad that it didn't make huge changes. We did have shutdowns. People might have heard we had shutdowns and we, um, rewrote during those shutdowns. I mean, Katie was amazing, because I think we had two big ones, two two-week yeah, shutdowns, and you rewrote them. Was that because somebody script. got COVID and you had to shut down? We, none of our crew, they were so incredible. None of our cast or crew, uh, they were just so responsible living in this bubble. They didn't get it. It was day players, which was nearly impossible. Mm -hmm. um, one was a test that I think was inconclusive in the end, but one was in the big party scene and that was, we were very lucky that no one else got sick and she was okay, but yeah, Katie used those shutdowns really effectively. It was a it was a wonderful challenge in terms of those shutdowns too. I mean, in some ways it's nice to have a moment to look back at, because when you're making the movie, everything's moving at such lightning speed. You're trying to keep up with it, but you don't always have the time. So in trying to find a silver lining in what was an incredibly disappointing Scary situation to be able to look back and say, what are the things we're surprised by? What are the things that we're you know, happier that we thought we'd be? What are the things we want to course correct as it's happening? And being able to use that time to do so, and occasionally have to rewrite for other you know scheduling things that change when those things happen. Yeah. It was it was a constant source of evolving. <laughs> But I'm real optimist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we talked a lot about um, Steven Spielberg yeah. and the shark and Jaws the shark? when the when the shark robot broke. Of course, famous, yeah. And we kept saying, "What's the shark? Yeah. What's the shark?" And being able to approach difficulties with that mindset, with like we're going to look back and say, "Thank goodness this happened," as long as everyone's okay, because we wouldn't have thought of this, or we wouldn't have come to this, or we wouldn't have considered this angle if we hadn't had this time. And that is something that, that Olivia set out from the beginning. And it really did help, not just emotionally, when you're making a movie in this confusing time, but it, I think we did. Like I think the, the changes that we made and the, the adjustments we were able to make and the things we were able to add, I'm so grateful are in the movie. I'm so grateful for that time and that ability to, to change and keep evolving that way. Yeah, and the fact that we got the time to then finish it. You know, we're lucky. They didn't just shut us down. They could have easily just shut us down. Because, you know, at a certain, I guess at a certain point we had spent too much money and they were like, I guess let them finish it. Um, but they were liking what they were seeing enough that they let us go. I think what was cool is that that feeling of 
um, everyone really wanting to be there. Because of course we said to the crew, if anybody wants to stop, as you know, this was right at the height of lockdown. Like we were one of the first, we were the first, we were the first production to go back in LA. Oh, wow. Okay. So it was a little <laughs> no bit of pressure. <laughs> but we said to the crew, like, if anybody doesn't want to come to work, you don't have to come to work. We will never pressure you. People showed up. Everyone showed up. And so that feeling of people not dragging their heels through work every day was kind of extraordinary. Also, we had 10 hour days, you know, because of the, the parameters set forth by the COVID restrictions. Thank you. It was awesome intense. Everyone gets it. And then, you know, it was great because I think because everyone was getting sleep and, you know, getting, get not falling asleep on the drive home and everyone felt taken care of, like, I think morale was, was really high. Um, and and we just really felt like a very secure family. Um, but it felt like, okay, we're very lucky. You know, this was when everyone was saying the movie business is dead. Right. And so it felt like, wow, we're so lucky to be making a movie. And that energy just coursed through everything. Like people were just thrilled. Um, and and I, I hope that we can maintain that. I don't want to lose that no. sense. It's interesting, last night I saw Steven Spielberg's new film in Toronto, and uh, he came in the Q&A, and he said the same thing. He says, you know, I'm doing this now, my very personal movie, it's sort of about me, because we didn't know if there would be a movie business after that. That's Steven Spielberg wow. saying that, and that's kind of heavy. Yeah. And, you know, and everyone's gone out and persevered, and now theaters are open, and on a final note here, this movie was made to be seen on a screen with an audience, and that's important, isn't it? Yeah, it's so important. It's actually the reason that we went with New Line and Warner Brothers, because they were committed to theatrical. We got offered more money from the streamers. Yeah. I really wanted this to be experienced theatrically. And so it was engineered with that in mind. From the sound mix, Skip Lieste was our sound mixer. It's an unbelievable mix. We, we wanted you know, those effects to feel totally immersive. I wanted people to gather and to kind of be inducted into victory together. Like, it, it's so intentionally made for the theatrical experience. So we just feel so fortunate that we get to do that. And, you know, it, it studios are still doing that with a few mid-level films. Right. And, and um, that's a great sign. Yeah, because, yeah, go ahead. I just it's another similarity to comedies is that you want to watch it with a big group. Like, you want to watch it as part of the bigger crowd. Oh my crowd. God, you ha have, I saw a movie again in Toronto the other night, Bros, which is coming out. And I can't imagine sitting at home watching that by myself because the it, laughter is contagious when yeah. you have a comedy. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I believe in it so much. And I think that, you know, luckily, you know, David Zaslav is now running. Warner Brothers Discovery seems to really believe in it too. But we just have to keep fighting for it. And, you know, I think that the studios were really surprised by how much how important it was to us. I think they assume that we all just want the most money. Right. They don't realize that it's like, no, actually the reason we do it is for this experience. Um, and it's no disrespect to the streamers and all the fantastic content that they're making. But I, it's just like, we, this is a love letter to theatrical films. And um, I just feel so lucky that we get to actually come and, out. And boy, do uh, they need it now. The exhibitors, you saw one company just go bankrupt mm -hmm. and it's it's uh, sketchy out there. So. Yeah. And this period here b before Avatar, they call it, you know, is <laughs> got to keep it going. So I wish you the best of luck when this opens on the 23rd and hope everybody lines up. Thank you so much.